Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's event organized by the GSAP Collective for Beirut. I'm really thrilled to have this ongoing uh, conversation at this call. Um, over the last decade, Lebanon has really been struggling with an economic meltdown, hosting the highest number of refugees per quota in the world. The COVID-19 pandemic, political vacuum, and one of the biggest human-made explosions to modern history happened there just a year ago on August 4th. This event belongs to a series of works that shed light on the current state of Beirut and is part of a one big conversation at GSAP thanks to our alumni, our faculty, and our students. Past initiatives so far have included the November 12th event, Emergency Architecture and Planning, Recovery Be Recovering Beirut Post-Explosion, which brought together a group of multidisciplinary professionals to a roundtable discussion that explores, explored ideas about architecture and cities in a time of emergency. In the spring of 2021, the research seminar, Reconnecting Beirut, uh, brought together faculty and students from all over the world to wrestle with challenging questions following the port blast. And the publication produced, um, Reconnecting Beirut, compiled all of the students' work to mark the one-year anniversary of the blast. Throughout this process, editors of the publication also sought out additional Lebanese and international experts in architecture, urban planning, public health, and more to reflect on the current needs of Beirut. I want in particular to thank faculty Richard Plans and Victor Buddy Lawson for their leadership across the studio and seminar and in supporting uh, the students, our alumni and, and the publication in particular. There's a beautiful book by a professor at the Université Saint-Joseph um, called uh, Beirut 2020, The Story of the Collapse. And it's a daily diary um, of the situation. And I've always felt that it is uh, for better, for worse, a prism through which sometimes we can see uh, other places in the world and the sense of collapse and hope uh, that we tend to hold together. So I'm really excited today uh, to be welcoming uh, together scholars, designers, activists, and development professionals to think about ways of transforming many of the sort of brilliant ideas, temporary fixes, and other that hopefully will uh, bring new life uh, to the city and bring new ideas to other cities around the world. Welcome. Well, I, I just want to mirror um, Amal's comments and thank everyone who who organized this event. And, and of course, to thank Amal because she's um, she supported the studio since, what is it, August 5th, day two. <laughs> and um, it's, it's, it's in the report. It's a kind of long story. We, we were going to do something else in Beirut, and then, uh, of course, uh, the explosion happened. So, um, fortunately, we we're able to get this together. And I would also thank our students, of course. I hope I hope some of them are on, um, and we'll hear from them. Uh, and especially though there was a follow-up seminar in the spring, the studio was in the fall, and they really persevered uh, in in getting this, getting the report together to making more coherent sense of the studio and uh, had a lot of interest and empathy in a place which of course Beirut, a place which we could not visit. So um, I think they deserve a lot of credit. And uh, they come from many parts of the world, um, which is always interesting, but I, I think in the end, um, maybe we can find a bit of the Beirut situation in other cities. So there, there was a kind of, of um, let's say sympathy that went beyond the explosion itself with the, the general uh, situation of governance. Um, so the studio focus evolved to a place where we could not, we, we didn't know where it was going at the beginning, let's just say it. Um, and it did evolve in a way that, that uh, makes some sense, at least we think. And of course, we're really pleased that somehow the work could be a catalyst for this kind of discussion that we're having today and maybe make a small difference. Um, I don't know, uh, Victor, are you with us yet? No, I guess not. Well, there, there was a, several people that really helped with the studio part, Amal, um, and I think they're they're with us today. Um, of course, Serge Yazigi is one of the, the um, 
the people will be speaking. Then there was Markelli DeMarco, who was with uh, WHO and um, has been been very influential in, in kind of the direction of the work in general. There was Philippe de Court, who was with the UN Habitat uh, and really very supportive. Um, Noor uh, uh, Zogbi Fares is a, a GSAP alum, um, was extremely helpful uh, in, in, in getting the, uh, the site work together and following things. Of course, Yasmin, uh, who um, was the, the, the student really in charge of putting together the report uh, was uh, went, you know way beyond the call of duty to do that. Um, Maria Paula Suto uh, in the Urban Design Lab was actually her idea and her initiative that got us started on this in the, in the first place. So we owe a great deal of thanks to her. Um, I'm sure there are others, but anyway, I will, I will stop and pass it along um, so we can get started. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So the event uh, today from emergency patchwork to the long term is an attempt to continue talking about Beirut and its needs. Um, the abstract that we put together focused on, you know, looking at the needs of Beirut after two years of economic crisis, the pandemic, and the August 4, 2020 port blast. Ever since we noticed that emergency initiatives such as remittances by the diaspora or the actual transport of essential supplies through commercial travel have temporarily relieved the Lebanese community ecosystem and crumbling infrastructure. However, with no centralized or national organization in sight, such efforts are nothing more than patchwork solutions. And this is where our conversation is starting. So the livelihood of communities in Beirut today and beyond are really hinged on this very unsteady lifeline of supplies, be it food, medication, clean water, energy, and more. And our main question is how can these initiatives of emergency patchwork transform to longer term solutions and sustained systems that lead to prosperity? We have a great lineup of activists and uh, people working in development, as well as um, urban planning and design, and much more um, in scholarship that are trying to um, find ways um, to make this happen. So here's a brief introduction of each of our panelists. Um, and then each panelist will uh, have a few minutes to present uh, a short presentation. And then we will kick it off with some questions. So Amina Merkbawi is a former board director and Beirut Disaster Relief Fund Committee representative at Impact Lebanon. Born and raised in Norway as half Lebanese and half Norwegian, Amina started to develop a strong connection to Lebanon during her first trip five years ago while volunteering in a refugee camp in Beirut. Her passion for humanitarian work further unfolded through her engagement as a volunteer in Shatila refugee camp, as a mentor at Environment Academy, and involvement with several non-governmental organizations in uh, Lebanon. With an interest and an academic background in emerging economies um, and international development, Amina obtained her master's researching aid effectiveness in Lebanon at King's College London. Now she is based in Beirut, working as a youth innovation manager at UNICEF, which involves providing innovation and entrepreneurship opportunities for vulnerable youth, as well as applying innovation and creative thinking to humanitarian programming. Our second panelist is Elias Khalil, who is a member of Muwatinun wa Muwatinat Fidawla, MMFD, which stands for Citizens in a State. It is a progressive opposition party in Lebanon. MMFD's specific aim is to turn the unfolding crisis into an opportunity for the formation of a secular, democratic, just, and potent state in Lebanon. Elias is based out of Canada, where he's an assistant professor of industrial engineering at the University of Toronto. 
Our third panelist is Manal Kahale. Raised in Lebanon, Manal studied landscape architecture at the American University of Beirut and holds a master's degree in lighting design from Parsons School of Design. She worked in the US for four years before deciding to go back to Lebanon and try and bridge both words, worlds through lighting. However, her return to Lebanon was much more difficult than anticipated with the unfolding economic crisis, the pandemic, and finally the August 4th, 4th blast. This catastrophe unlocked feelings of communal support triggered by the complete absence of any relief efforts on the part of the Lebanese government. And as a result, Manal decided to use her knowledge and experience to partake in relief efforts as a citizen and a lighting activist. Thus, Light for Lebanon was created in partnership with Light Reach, a program focused on providing rapidly deployable solar lighting solutions to support the residents of Beirut affected by the August 4 explosion. Our next panelist is Saj Yaziji who is an architect, urban planner, and head of Yaziji Atelier since 2005. He's also a regional consultant in sustainable development in Mashriq and Maghrib countries. In parallel, Yaziji acted as a senior consultant for Dar al-Handasa, Talib and Partners in Architecture and Planning Projects in Lebanon and the region between 1999 and 2009. He has led several projects financed by international organization, in relation to urban renewal and strategic planning in Lebanon and the region. In 2007, he founded Majal, the academic urban observatory at Alba University of Balamand with the aim of facilitating research and assisting localities in the formation of adaptive development strategies. He has also directed several publications in relation to planning law and regulation. Currently, Serge is an adjunct professor of urban planning and design at the American University of Beirut, Serge holds a PhD in contemporary history in the field of urban renewal from the University of Bordeaux, France. Finally, last but not least, Yara Akari is an international development professional with more than 10 years of experience, including six years working at Ah Finance, where she was a project manager supporting renewable energy and energy access projects for the Inter-American Development Bank and USAID in Haiti, Uganda, and Kenya. As a consultant, she has expertise in project management, market research, business development, strategy design, monitoring and evaluation on topics including access to finance, community engagement, energy access, and climate change to agencies such as GIZ, USAID, UNDP, and UNESCO. Yara works as a consultant and team leader at GreenMax Capital Advisors in New York, and is also managing a women empowerment initiative between Centre d'Orient, a private soap company in Lebanon and the UNDP. The initiative consists in training, mentoring and increasing opportunities for low income women in Lebanon. Yara holds a master's in development studies from the London School of Economics and a master's and a bachelor in international economics from Paris de Pantheon Assas University. And I will, uh, have Iyad uh, introduce the speakers. Thank you, Maureen, for the brief introduction for the speakers. I also want to thank Ziad Jamaldeen for joining us. People who don't know Ziad, Ziad is an educator and practitioner. He teaches at Columbia. Uh, how are you? Uh, so I'm, we're going to start with the presentations by the panelists, and then later on, we're going to move to the uh, questions, please. Uh, it's going to be organic a conversation. Everyone, please share your thoughts. Uh, we'll start with Amina Markabi. Um, I just want to briefly introduce uh, everyone to Impact Lebanon, the um, organization itself. Uh, it's uh, funded by members of the Lebanese diaspora in London. Uh, following the Beirut uprising of October 17th, uh, and the organization is 100% volunteer run. It composes now of a diverse group of 120 active members. Uh, the mission of the organization is to act as a hub for initiatives that deliver a positive impact for Lebanon. And yeah, thank you. Can move to the next one. 
Yeah, so here can you, you can see some of the areas, some of the members um, are coming from all over the world. Uh, it's very bottom up, grassroots uh, driven. Um, and it, uh, you know, is actually drives by this collaboration between organizations in Lebanon and the diaspora itself. Um, following the Beirut blast, um, the organization set up quickly a, con a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, we raised about exactly to nine point two million dollars. Um, so as a volunteer organization, we quickly had to put in place organizational procedural measures. Um, we launched a fund strategy um, and set up fund uh, transfer processes, uh, fund allocation and monitoring teams, and developing key partnerships to extend our capabilities to deliver um, the fundraisers' objectives. Um, eventually, we ended up funding 18 different NGOs within six verticals, re residential rehabilitation, heritage rehabilitation, micro and small businesses support, livelihood, uh, medical and hospital support, uh, mental health and community support. Um, on this topic, um, speaking about how these emergency initiatives um, can transform into long-term solution, um, we think it's um, a key question to ask about um, aid dependence, um, where uh, many argue that assistance of this kind of nature can pose a barrier to the country's development and sustainable economic growth. Um, and you rarely hear about countries becoming developed by aid. Um, you can often rather on the other end hear about countries becoming de uh, dependent on aid. Um, intentionally or not, uh, but uh, when it's used as a long-term strategy, it can inhibit development and progress and reform. Uh, so on this note, I would like to distinguish um, between emergency aid and development aid. Um, and for impact, this disaster relief fund was a major turning point. Um, we saw it as a unique emergency situation. And we have to rethink our role in the context of the broader um, ongoing civil society efforts. In Lebanon um, and we long term decided to focus on our goals which are driving civic engagement and political awareness in the diaspora as well as building the capacity of institutions and individuals in Lebanon uh, just to mention a few initiatives that we have which is Saudi um, and Environment Academy. Thank you. Thank you Amina. Uh, Elias. Yes, thanks, Iyad uh, and Maureen. Uh, and thanks to the, the GSAP Collective for Beirut for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm representing Muatinun wa Muatinat Fidawla, or Citizens in a State in English, uh, which is a political party uh, in the opposition that was formed in 2016 uh, in anticipation of the coming economic crisis, um, one which we now know retrospectively that uh, you know, there were many indices uh, for uh, that were, of course, uh, ignored by the, the ruling uh, parties uh, and also by uh, foreign powers uh, who are interested uh, in Lebanon. Uh, and unfortunately, at the time, uh, kind of uh, Muatinun's uh, plea was not very effective at um, moving the state of affairs uh, towards uh, anticipating, recognizing, and potentially uh, avoiding uh, the crisis, which we came to experience uh, very uh, in very ugly ways since uh, end of 2019. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there arose this opportunity uh, for our political party and other opposition parties uh, to uh, uh, you know seize the moment uh, and grow and try to actually uh, form an alternative. Uh, a, a real political alternative which can uh, get enough uh, support and backing uh, to make a, to make an impact. So in my presentation, I will try to relate uh, our political uh, objectives and goals to the questions uh, uh, that of this uh, of this panel of this meeting. Um, so the main question uh, posed here uh, is the following: the livelihoods of communities in Beirut and beyond uh, are hinged to this unsteady lifeline of supplies. How can these initiatives transform to longer term solutions and sustain systems that lead to prosperity? Uh, so in this panel, I try to uh, argue for the following answer uh, through our involvement uh, as concerned citizens. And here I don't 
mean just myself, I mean also uh, other uh, Lebanese citizens uh, and or residents on the call, our involvement within a well-defined transformative political project that can quickly lay the foundations to a civil state and initiate economic reconstruction on the basis of the interests of Lebanon citizens and residents. Um, so there's lots of uh, fancy words in there and I'll try to um, break them apart uh, in the next few slides. So by transformative political project, uh, I'd like to contrast that with patchwork alone. So uh, patchwork in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. In certain circumstances, such as uh, uh, following the, the August 4th blast, uh, some patchwork was definitely needed and necessary in the absence of uh, you know, a functional state uh, and also uh, lack of financial resources to support any kind of uh, reconstruction or uh, emergency measures. But patchwork alone uh, will not be sufficient in the long term. Uh, and this, I will argue, hopefully later on in the panel, uh, is due to really just simple material economic uh, reasons. So it's not bad on its own, it's just not sufficient. It might be necessary in some cases. Uh, and also transformative uh, uh, stands in sharp contrast with uh, you know, certain theories of change from inside the system, uh, which have been kind of advocated uh, uh, following the formation of the Hassan Diab government uh, a year and a half ago, where uh, you know, there were many PhDs on the cabinet, many uh, supposedly you know, highly educated, uh, experienced, private sector experienced, uh, uh, individuals there that ended up really not doing anything for, for most of the term of this cabinet. It was not active at all. Uh, and in the one instance where it did anything, which is uh, one uh, economic plan, the same plan was shut down by the same political parties that brought uh, this, uh, this cabinet about. So change from inside is not possible, hence the need for a project which is transformative and political in nature. Um, another keyword here is quickly. So time is of the essence. Um, what I'd like to contrast that with is uh, three other scenarios. One, uh, which uh, other individuals or opposition uh, groups advocate for, is long-term incremental change. The idea that uh, you know society uh, might be a sectarian, uh, might not have recovered from the aftermath of the civil war, and so on and so forth. Hence, we need a process of re-education re that starts from the bottom up that might take a generation or two before its effects uh, kick in. Um, there's a clear counter argument to that, which we, we, we hold, which is that uh, we would like to save as much of our current society as possible. Uh, the costs of that are not factored into any plan for long-term uh, incremental change. So uh, one must set uh, the basis for protecting what we currently have and by that, we don't mean just uh, material resources, uh, but individuals, people, uh, et cetera, before we can start thinking about long-term incremental change. The other uh, uh, element that uh, is also uh, kind of in a race with any quick transformation is the risk of local regional settlements. So this is something that we are literally at the risk of at the moment with the Mikati cabinet, the risk that what happened in following the civil war in, in 1990 happens again where you know the main states that are at conflict supposedly in Lebanon come to an agreement and decide to refloat the same uh, sectarian ruling political class uh, to the detriment uh, uh, of the population. Uh, and third is the mass forced immigration uh, and, and increasing poverty uh, that is accelerating day to day. Um, and any kind of long-term change uh, will really not be able to help those people. The people we are losing now uh, to good jobs uh, abroad, uh, or those who are taking uh, risks with their lives, getting on uh, small boats to cross to uh, Turkey or Greece, uh, we're, we might never get them back. Uh, and that we think uh, is a crucial factor uh, to think about. So when we say a civil state, uh, there's two main words here, civil and state. Uh, starting with state, we, we believe that there was never really a state in Lebanon. So the illusion that We've had a state and potentially we can tweak a thing or two uh, uh, and get there uh, is for us extremely unlikely. We've only had kind of this uh, mishmash of sectarian leaders that just handle the interests of their groups uh, at different times, not really uh, any form of central state. By civil here, and there's a nuance for civil and secular, uh, but we use civil to say non-militaristic and a state in which uh, uh, citizens deal directly with the state, not through uh, 
uh, uh, mediation uh, with a sectarian leader or 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 church or or you know uh, any kind of uh, religious uh, sect authority, uh, and so this stands in sharp contrast with the current sectarian arrangement um, and also other less thought out arrangements, ones which uh, you know maybe undermine the, the the existence of a strong central state. We believe that for a small country like Lebanon, such a state is the only viable form. Uh, for governance uh, in a democratic uh, uh, state. Um, and we need to initiate economic reconstruction. Uh, this is also in contrast with relying eternally either on foreign political do dollars. So said, uh, said Paris 1, Paris 2, said 3, et cetera, all these initiatives which ended up actually funding the system which collapsed uh, on our heads. Uh, also eternal reliance on expat transfers. We know that's a function of global economic conditions, uh, and also on partial sectoral solutions, you know, small fixes in one of these sectors that I'm listing here. So these are all non-tradable basic services. Uh, any solution that only hits one of these is probably going to uh, uh, affect uh, possibly negatively others. So thinking about education alone without public transport is probably not going to do it because people can't get around, and this is a problem we're currently uh, facing. And last, uh, the focus on the interest of Lebanon's citizens and residents. This is in contrast with the interests of individual sects. This is how the current political class sees uh, uh, citizens, not as citizens of Lebanon, but citizens of particular sets. And also the interests of foreign powers who uh, might at times uh, seem to be uh, you know, uh, wholeheartedly looking to help Lebanon, uh, but really we need to think of them as external power powers with interests and us uh, as, a, as an internal power with its own interest. And the process that happens after that is one of uh, negotiation uh, with, uh, with the other nations. And so that's our political project, one which we think could benefit from you know, all of you's uh, contribution uh, and interest. And I hope to argue for that more in the coming panel. Thank you. Thank you, Elias. Uh, I think we're going to discuss a lot about the role of architects and designers adopting a political project later on. So that would be very helpful. Uh, the next person is Manal. Yes. Hi, everyone. Let me just put it on PowerPoint. So first of all, thank you for having me here today. I'm here to talk about Light for Lebanon and how it is both a short term and a long term solution for Lebanese in those times of need. So, first of all, I'm going to talk a bit about the problem and I'm going to take you a few steps back. And for those who are not very familiar with the situation today, Lebanon has undergone some huge changes in the past few years and still is. And we are going through one of the largest economic crisis, political instability, uh, the explosion, the power outage, not to mention the pandemic and shortage of fuel and whatnot. And all of this has led uh, to some drastic changes in an urban setup and identity. And we can see this in our homes, on the streets, in the communities with the people, and in our cities that are, have now turned into ghost towns. Um, and these changes translate in lighting questions. So um, everyone, not just lighting designers, understand the consequence of the absence of light. Theft, theft increased. Uh, there is uh, already PTSD available. Uh, all around, not available. Uh, there is a negative impact on the economy due to, to the closure of businesses, restaurants, shops. And as lighting designer, um, we looked at the impact of the blast on the lighting situation. And the questions we have asked ourselves are, <clears throat> first of all, what can be done now as an individual to remedy the sudden darkness? And this is taking into consideration um, that there is already an existing grid, uh, that there are other aids that we don't no, we're kept in the dark of where they're going to be implemented. So we wanted to make sure not to overlap uh, in our efforts and making our efforts, efforts temporary or go to waste. The second questions we uh, the second question we raised was what can be done now towards the long term, and this is making sure that there is existing products. It's affordable, and of course. Uh, with the future of design sustainable, which led us to the third question, what do we need to rebuild a sustainable Beirut? So I was drawn to solar lighting. And um, of course, uh, 
when we're in a state of emergency, uh, we don't recreate, we don't reinvent the wheel. So I reached out to my former thesis advisor, whose NGO operates a global solar lighting initiative for communities, uh, which have been done in Haiti and in Puerto Rico. And we partnered to launch the Light for Lebanon program. So you can see over here, um, we have uh, Light for Lebanon applies light tier model. Uh, and we have three scales. The three scales are, first of all, the portable lights, which are uh, very quickly distributed for homes, for school, for cultural um, promotion in terms of uh, playing around, having kids play around with light and use it in different ways. We also have a security floodlights uh, that are used uh, at entry building entryways and also in uh, architecture and landscape, uh, depending on the projects and what are the needs. And we have the street lights, which are uh, uh, used for light brightening up the streets and the public sector. Now for the process, um, so for any intervention, first of all, we need to what we what we needed to do is establish first of all uh, jurisdiction, which must be coordinated with some governmental entity. In our case, it was the municipality and the army, since Lebanon was going through the emergency relief uh, situation. So we filled out the necessary administration and legal paperwork. We then uh, collaborated with NGOs that are already on the ground and connected to communities because. We need to help each other help each other technically uh, and then engage with residents to hear out their needs and best address the community's context let people as well guide us to uh, towards the places they use that need to, that need to be revived with light so when we are doing a project uh, the first things we look at are first of all of course the location we look at the road width and and collaboration with and coordination with the building heights to see if there's enough sunlight coming in and seeing the community to know what who really is living there what how are they using the space and we have a lack of public spaces in lebanon so just seeing the informal gathering spaces and listening to where they want to where people what are the spaces people want to use so we started then by the process by doing a site analysis. Um, I'm leading the team on the ground and our US team includes expats who are the fundraiser ambassadors and the light uh, helping us raise the funds. And then we have a light reach team which administrates the program and handles the logistics. Uh, we work with the volunteers to survey the night condition and we test our products to make sure that the tools we're using are powerful enough and if not how to use them, where to use them. And we met with several NGOs to explore the opportunities and partner on existing and future renovation and reconstruction uh, projects. And uh, you can see uh, over here, it was based on just literally going door to door, seeing what's out there and seeing how our products will start making an impact hopefully on the ground. Um, so for uh, the, the program, program implementation, um, we typically follow a collaborative process and all the installations are done with our partner NGOs and local residents and any volunteer on the ground. So the portable were door to door where we started handing them off. The, that was the first intervention. And then the security floodlights, which sometimes were used as you can see in the picture here for any time with a sensor, anytime anyone enters a building, it goes to full brightness or sometimes for landscape purposes, uh, whenever we had canopies uh, blocking any entryway or road. And the street lights where um, we started, we collaborated with the Live Love Beirut and installed a road leading to an, a hospital. So uh, other than anything that was needed on the ground, we also, um, urban lighting is important, not just from a utilitarian viewpoint. It, it is also important for placemaking and projects become beacons for the surrounding communities. So we are designing light for architectural and landscape projects where you can see uh, landmark buildings where we were testing out which tools will be, will be best to start highlighting those and create beacons in the city and bring back life. Or, uh, going to, towards any place that has a potential to be a gathering space and recreate a public space by using the landscape and highlighting those beautiful elements that make our city unique. Um, 
we also believe that urban uh, we also believe that the vision and mission uh, of light reach is that light is about life after dark and we consider that art and culture are an essential part of life so we also intervened uh, we also try to intervene as much as possible uh, with anything that revives the community itself and makes them want to stay in lebanon or use their get a little bit of hope in those dark days uh, so we have, for example, we, part we partnered up uh, with Anu Sanid, where we had a project with Participlay, uh, a group of foreign students that uh, wanted to create a little space for children to play in, in Birj Hamoud. So we used the solar, uh, solar lights of different scale, the two first scales, and try to make it useful even at night. And then we also uh, did the temporary art platform, uh, which was reviving a forest abandoned along the river of Beirut and try to use the products in the most creative way possible and making sure, of course, always keeping in mind uh, vandalism and all those things and uh, maintenance, which, uh, we, yeah, which you can, I'm not going to waste your time with all of that, but it's all taken into consideration, which you can check out in our social media or websites. Thank you. Thank you, Manal. Uh, now we'll go to search. Yes, uh, hello. So thank you, Iyad and Maureen and Teresa for this invitation. Um, actually, I will, I will definitely react as an urban planner which, uh, I mean, this is my, my main uh, hat. Uh, even though also I'm a political activist, but we might talk about this a bit later. Um, so when, when the blast happened, uh, I would like to, to, to show you one, one, two plans that were circulated a few, few weeks. Most of you are quite familiar with those plans. So it kind of subdivided an already very much fragmented uh, uh, area, uh, socially, economically, politically, community, confessionally fragmented, and very much vulnerable. And those were the plans that were kind of trying to organize the work of all uh, the, the NGOs, local, international, regional association, working on the ground. And uh, Maureen, you can show also the two others. I mean, they're, they, they reproduce all, all the, the, those subdivisions. And this raised our fears actually and several of colleagues friends of mine also we started feeling that do we really want to be turned into uh, another haiti and 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 we 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 uh, we had some of us had the opportunity to to be part of the discussions that were led by international organizations and uh, uh, i mean major stakeholders that were that wanted to, to, to contribute or felt that they were concerned by this reconstruction effort. And the, the motto, I mean, the, the discussion, what we tried always to bring back on the table is that, please, don't put the government aside. Whatever is our differences and situation, uh, and whatever is our political opinion of this government, uh, needless, I mean, to elaborate on that, but definitely because my generation of, of urban planners uh, uh, was conscious about the reconstruction of the downtown by Solidaire, a private company. And Majal that I founded was founded in the aftermath of the Israeli war of 2006 and in the objective also of monitoring reconstruction. So we said, come on guys, we learned from previous reconstruction. There's a limit of what others can do if we don't put on the table national institutions. Uh, I'll go back to that point because actually some of the international uh, um, and major stakeholders kind of reacted positively to our discourse up to a certain point. Uh, but meanwhile, also we collaborated with Colombia very quickly. Uh, I, I had this idea of organizing, uh, I mean, to try to have a comprehensive approach in the reconstruction. Uh, Colombia World Project also uh, showed interest into that. And we organized something like eight, nine uh, the, uh, major con conversation, which brought also on the table something like 300 international experts on topics like public spaces, heritage, port reconstruction, infrastructure, and so on. 
and they elapsed for several months with the objective of kind of formulating a global vision for the reconstruction. But meanwhile, also that was done so with the Beirut Urban Lab, uh, to, to which I'm also affiliated. And also the Beirut Urban Lab kind of started pushing forward for a new discourse. So trying to promote the recovery notion as to an opposition to the reconstruction, stating that recovery might be more fitted to what is happening. And they took, I mean, the, uh, with the, with, uh, 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 under the lead of Dr. Huayda Harisi, so uh, a group of uh, uh, experts started working on the quarantina and are still working there with this bottom-up approach and trying to say that recovery also entails the social and economic dimension and not only the physical rehabilitation. And it's definitely a long process. So each time trying to say we learned from what happened and even though uh, the work done by NGOs is incredibly important and we compare some of them as being heroes because they really worked into very difficult conditions. And if they were not there, I think the situation would have been really, really terrible. So, but we, we, we need to, to, to reflect on a different dynamic, okay, as, as urban planners. And the funny thing is that if the state didn't actually react positively to us asking the state to act and to react and to assume its responsibilities, but they were very much interested into another project and that was the port. So I was also assigned by uh, the order of engineers and architects to prepare the working sessions on the port reconstruction uh, for the uh, urban declaration of the OEA. And there we discovered that many actors were coming with plans and that actually uh, behind the scenes, uh, local, uh, uh, local central institutions were very much interested. And they were pushing forward for those plans and saying we are eager to take responsibility and to play our role. So this discrepancy, which is quite terrible and, and very much uh, unfortunate between a project that could bring some money and could kind of open the appetite of some investors versus the, the, those very much important neighborhood where the, the, the state said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested. Let, let the others work and, and do their, their, their responsibilities. So I, I will stop here just to, to respect my few minutes, but I'm definitely uh, eager to, to, to react on all those points later on. Thank you. Thank you, Serge. Uh, last, Tiara. Yes, hello. Um, so I wanted to actually do something a little bit different. Um, I, of course, um, as a Lebanese, I'm aware of, of obviously the current situation and I have experience working in Lebanon, but I thought it would be interesting for me to share, um, let me share my presentation, to share um, uh, some work that I have done recently in Haiti and kind of to present an example of what can be done. Uh, I'll make that sign bigger. Okay, what can be done in, um, in, in a country that has actually some similarities with, um, with, with Lebanon. Um, so I just wanna make sure you're seeing the full screen. Um, so here, so so I've I've worked for several years in Haiti. Um, that was right after the earthquake. So as probably most of you know, there was a huge earthquake in 2010. Um, Haiti is already a country where um, there was a very low access to um, grid electricity. At the time, it was 28% of the population, and um, and same as Lebanon. I mean, there's a high level of remittances. So very um, a, you know big diaspora community, mostly based in the U.S., Canada, who were most of them were actually sending money um, to Haitian back in the country. And, and a fourth of this money of those remittances on a monthly basis was actually spent by the local household to buy um, uh, gas, um, kerosene, um, to be able to like have some sort of energy source in the house. So, um, 
And so, as you probably know, I mean, Haiti has also, unfortunately, a lot of similarities also with Lebanon in terms of like the issues with government, with corruption, a weak public sector. Um, uh, and so there was a huge focus on humanitarian solution at first, especially post the earthquake. Um, and so I worked on a project that I think is interesting here to share, especially that we want to work, look at sustainable models and long term solutions. So I thought, OK, I'll, I'll share I'll share this example. So in this project that I worked on, we were trying to link to find a more sustainable way to link remittances to actually a solar product for two reasons to get people to, you know, give access to people to re reliable and safe source of energy. Um, and also to to uh, to you know to um, avoid like all the issues with climate change, of course, and the problem with deforestation and um, and the use of kerosene, and and the issues with also using candles. So I know now in Lebanon, as you know, Manal also explained, there's a huge um, issue of like access to light and energy electricity. Um, so so basically, in this project, we were trying to not donate and that's one thing that i want to highlight is obviously after events like earthquakes there's a lot of donation right so all the emergency initiatives that are in place and one of them in the case of haiti was donating solar light and what hap happened a couple of years later when we tried to put together this project working along the private sector is that all those donations kind of spoiled the market and there was two things there was it created dependency on aid, I mean, of course, when it came to food as well, and a lot of different um, uh, things that were donated or you know helped Haitian at the time, and it also um, it also created a distortion of the market. So you're not incentivizing the local people to actually pay for something, but they're expected to have it as a donation. So basically, in two words, that project we put together was trying to find the link between the Haitian diaspora, the remittances sent to the country, and enable them to place an order directly for a solar home system um, uh, with you know, a couple of lights, sometimes uh, mobile phone charging, uh, radio, sometimes it comes with TV sets. I mean, there's a bunch of things that we you could you could do with a solar home system and um, and trying to get also find financial mechanisms so Haitian could afford the system. So that was like working with a microfinance institution or sometimes the solar product provider would provide some type of financing, you know, payment in installments, you know, in four months, five months, six months or more. And so basically the reason why I'm talking about this is really I was trying to see, okay, what's what are the main differences between, you know, humanitarian intervention, which is, of course, very needed, you know, but then when you look at long term solutions um, and of course, it takes more time to implement design and then implement um, a, a, a business model. Um, uh, but it, it requires market research. It requires like what is really crucial is the identification of the local and international partners. Um, and you know, draft all the agreements. Um, but the the usually the business solutions are you know involving the public and also the private sector. And the focus here is really on the private sector. As I know, Lebanon has you know very a lot of smart, uh, engaged community. The diaspora is also very engaged in you know helping helping Lebanon. And so I think that you know putting all this like private sector in use, especially at times where where maybe the, the public sector could be a little bit of, a, of an issue. Um, uh, I mean, could be great in the, it's a great lesson learned as well for Lebanon. And so, you know, as I think a few people mentioned in our presentation, too much aid can kill aid in a way because you're, in, you're not incentivizing people to find local solutions. Um, and I think what we learn now with the blast and the issue with the currency and everything is like, you need local solutions. Um, you can't rely on importation all the time or, you know, um, so yes, so I think, I think, you know, and the last point would be the whole education awareness raising capacity building is also key. And that's one of the key of the success of a sustainable solution versus a more short term uh, patchwork solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yara, and uh, and thank thank you everyone. Uh...
Now, uh, Maureen is going to start with the questions. The one thing that I want to say, it's thank you for the impressive uh, presentations uh, and looking like at the different scales of interventions and dimensions that impact the livelihoods of the residents of Lebanon, from architecture to political, urban, economical, uh, and looking forward for the discussion. Maureen. Thank you, Yad. Um, one of the first questions we had uh, prepared for the panelists is, um, you know, in the wake of the precarious socioeconomic and political situation exacerbated by the pandemic, as you know, the Beirut port blast, uh, port blast and the banking system failure, the country has been witnessing numerous emergency relief initiatives as we saw in these um, presentations, as well as a grassroots organization to aid community initiatives including rebuilding efforts, in-kind distribution uh, of goods, uh, resort to sustainable energy solutions, fundraising efforts, and much more. So our question really is, um, so from your experience as uh, either a giver or a receiver and or an observer of such initiatives, what do you think are the structures, bureaucracies, and logistics needed for these initiatives to actually strive and another question, your follow up question to that is that how do you find communities are reacting to such efforts? Um, here I can see a lot uh, in, you know, a lot of this in Amina's work as well as in Elias's work, um, but others, are, other panelists are also welcome to jump in. Go ahead, Amina. Thank you. Um, like you said, yeah, it's been part of our work for sure. Um, and especially in an emergency situation when there's a lack of governance, um, you really kind of, you lack all these structures and bureaucracies and logistics that is needed. Um, eventually was started to develop slowly, but in, in the immediate response, um, it would have obviously been very helpful with um, rules and regulations, quality and standards. Um, especially when it comes to reconstruction of uh, buildings and infrastructure um, for, the, for this to happen in a safe and a secure manner. Um, also do no harm policies in place um, and in terms of effectiveness uh, of the delivery to have um, established coordination and collaboration in place as well. And all of this, um, especially when it comes to these uh, immediate grassroots and NGO response, it happened kind of organically after a time. Um, but on the second note, when you're uh, asking about the community's reaction, um, the communities and the beneficiaries on uh, in these houses uh, were um, kind of left uh, for as a decision maker on um, what kind of support do you need, um, what can you actually receive. There were NGOs visiting people in their homes, um, asking them about their needs. Um, several NGOs were, you know, doing these assessments, uh, visiting people. Um, and you're leaving the communities and the, the individuals as a decision maker of what can I aid do I need? What do I, um, what can I get? Um, how do I wish to receive it? Uh, they don't know what kind of quality they will receive. Um, are there any rules and regulations in place? Um, and this was questions for, I can imagine for the individuals that were approached by these NGOs. There was so many of them, uh, as you know, on the ground responding to the blast. Um, so uh, for these initiatives to really like bring on good impacts, there, uh, there is definitely a need of rules and regulations, logistics, um, and for aid to lead to development, uh, it needs to complement the strategy, a national strategy, um, and an overall plan that fosters sustainability and development. Um, and from Impact Lebanon's side, um, when we were selecting NGOs, uh, to receive funding, we hired a third party vetting and uh, quality assurance organization uh, to guarantee that the supporters uh, donations reached apolitical, non-sectarian, transparent and proficient NGOs. 
Thank you, Amina. Um, I just have a, a quick follow-up question. So what what was the uh, process that Impact Lebanon went through to identify uh, those beneficiaries that are not, you know, not secular, not politically affiliated, et cetera? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, so we got 150 uh, applicants. We first of all selected based on the proposals. Uh, we uh, had the um, a partner in Kodirat that helped us uh, skin, uh, skimming through the proposals. Um, and as you know that we are based in the diaspora, we um, didn't have the full overview of what's happening. It was very messy. Um, so we hired this third party uh, organization called 3QA to go to the NGOs. They, they gather all the information, the financial data, um, what they've done in the past, the registration documents, they interviewed them, um, went to the background of every single member and uh, really digged into the organizations to make sure that um, yeah, non-sectarian, apolitical, um, and all these requirements were met by the organization before um, signing any MOU. Got it. Thank you so much, Amina. Would anyone else like to jump in for this question? I can go. Go ahead, Elias. Uh, Manal, do you want to go? Manal, we can... No, no, it's okay. You can go first. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, so one of the keywords in the, in the, so I'll speak first as a, as an observer, um, of these, uh, let's say emergency efforts, but also as a receiver through my parents, whose, uh, whose home was damaged, uh, in, in, on August 4th. Um, so I got to see, although from distance, um, how they benefited from, uh, you know, immediate, uh, aid we're talking, uh, you know, on the next day, basically. Uh, help with uh, picking up uh, glass and uh, just uh, stapling some kind of uh, uh, half door uh, to just close things off and, uh, you know, temporary housing uh, with family and, and all those things, which many people uh, have had to go through. Um, and th this speaks to, to my initial point in the, in the presentations that such efforts review are uh, in many cases necessary, but not sufficient. Um, and so uh, if we think about uh, emergencies, uh, two things come to mind. I really would like to minimize, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the chances of having more and more emergencies, maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, hopefully not uh, some other uh, blast or uh, even climate emergencies, which many places in the world are kind of bound to run into uh, in the next uh, few decades. And, you know, we might be uh, victims of that with maybe sea level rise in the Mediterranean or things like that. Um, so there are things we can control and things we can't. Uh, if we wanted to have uh, proper emergency preparedness, uh, then uh, of course there's a role uh, to be played by a state uh, which anticipates in advance uh, possibilities, you know, think FEMA in the US. Uh, and of course, Lebanon does not need anything like uh, like FEMA, given its uh, its scale. Uh, so it's a, in general, a much simpler case uh, than uh, than most uh, countries, which maybe uh, the, the countries we live in, uh, which are much larger and much more exposed to such uh, possible disasters. Uh, so there's uh, there's that need, and even within. Uh, NGO type, uh, uh, you know, contributions to uh, relief after following emergencies. Uh, the question of just the basic logistics uh, is also an obvious one. You cannot put together, uh, you know, a, a transportation network uh, overnight uh, if you wanted to, you know, uh, just uh, chart a path to the transportation of certain uh, basic uh, materials uh, and goods. That is something that, uh, you know, should be kind of put together or set in advance as part of a uh, national uh, development policy, uh, right? Uh, which could also benefit from external help, but that's something that uh, you plan out over, uh, you know, at least years, uh, uh, if not, if not uh, decades. Um, and so uh, from the perspective of individuals who are contributing um, to such initiatives, uh, for us, the question should be, uh, where does my effort or this bounded number of hours that I'm able to spend uh, you know, offering my services uh, uh, to, Le to Lebanon and its people, what's the best place to put in that effort? And we think that putting all of that effort into only, uh, uh, you know, relief initiatives, again, however necessary they may be, uh, is pr 
possibly not the best uh, use of your time and energy. Uh, and at least part of that should be, uh, 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 part of that effort should be spent towards uh, something transformative, which we think can only be, uh, you know, a clear political project. And, you know, we, we hope to be offering one such political project uh, among others. Thank you so much, Elias. There's a lot to digest there. And I see links already with the conversations that have already been uh, presented. Um, we will uh, hear Manal's response, then we'll call on Philippe and Michele. Yes, sorry, I had a small power outage here. But um, so I just wanted to bring up just one topic uh, about communities reacting to such efforts. And uh, speaking of a sustainable solution and solar in particular, there was a lot of skepticism at first. And um, I, our solution was to push really hard towards a pilot project to prove that it works at first. And the second part of it is give ownership to people uh, because we tried, we have two solutions, two tech techniques when we want to install the solar lights. It's either on existing poles uh, that are owned by the municipality and the government or on facades of buildings. And um, of course, we tried as much as possible to keep, them, to keep the involvement easier via residents and facades and give them ownership and let them know that this is their uh, product, this is theirs to take care of, and keeping them as involved as possible helped a lot and uh, creating more awareness and helping push that effort forward. So it was just this little aspect I wanted to make sure because communities, it was really important to involve everyone around us for so many reasons, including theft and vandalism, all those things is important to start by the people themselves. So that's... Thank you, Manal, for this very on the ground observation. Um, you know, sometimes we talk about ideas and concepts and we forget that it's actually people's lives that we're trying to improve. And it's, it really starts with how they receive the, some of these like efforts that, um, you know, the, these initiatives are trying to uh, achieve. Um, next we'll go uh, Philippe de Corte, who is actually the head of UN Habitat Program Development here in New York City and um, played a big role uh, during the, um, the studio, uh, as well as with the, the publication with Professor Richard Plunz and Professor Victor Bodhi Lawson. Um, take it away, Philippe. Thanks, Maureen. I, I must say the question is very difficult. Uh, and I, Serge and I had a long conversation on this, which is partly captured in the publication. Uh, and so maybe a couple of thoughts are building on, on the, um, the presentations. One, I mean, we know that the way society was functioning in Beirut before the blast was far from perfect. It partly created the conditions, well, it created the conditions for actually what happens, and then the collapse uh, afterwards. So this challenge of the operating environment that was pre-blast, far from perfect and dysfunctional, uh, I mean, that should never be forgotten. The blast is not point zero. The blast is just a moment in this in a crisis that was happening already for quite uh, for quite a while, and 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 so the being able to craft a response that take in, takes into account that pre-crisis or pre-blast uh, condition, I think is important. Uh, although exactly we, when we talked, I talked to Serge, I mean, his point is, is, is important. You have to deal with government, with whatever government or governance you have in place, you cannot ignore it. So I think that's his point for me was very important and again, in a way to finding maybe this is an opportunity to create and change the dynamics a bit, change the dynamics between communities and government, the position of private sector. So it is a moment to kind of reshape the power dynamics, but I think it has to be done uh, involving whoever is in charge at that point in time, because they have to be held accountable and they have to be part of the solution at that point. The other thing that came to mind listening to um, some of the presentations is that, um, and specifically in Lebanon, again, because it's, an, it's a pre-crisis asset, this incredible capacity to innovate, this incredible capacity to, to be entrepreneurial. It's a quality in the assets of Lebanon and Lebanese people. And how do you, we know that it is an asset, how do you harness it? And I fully agree it, it's by making sure that from 
the early days, you're looking at this also from how can the private sector come in in a positive way, moving away as quick as you can from, from the kind of charity uh, knee jerk, I mean, charity first response you get, because you, on day two, you need to help people. So you need to be able to supply things that people can't afford, uh, that people don't have access to. Um, but quickly, I think it needs to exactly evolve into how do you rebuild, use that assets of, of bottom-up creativity and entrepreneurship that exists in Lebanon. And so I was interested in, and happy to listen to the uh, presentation on, on, the, uh, on the lightning that was made. Um, thirdly, I think also this issue of, yes, and that's why I'm happy that somebody from with the Haiti experience on the call, and we talked about it with Serge, you get this wave of NGOs, all good intended, but you're living in that street and you're getting five people knocking at your door, asking what you need and then disappear. There's something fundamentally wrong with that uh, because that's not how society works. That's not how you're going to help people. And so in a way, there is this bigger question, how do you create a framework at whatever initiative that is coming up, whatever energy you create that is part of the response, you harness it in a way that ultimately becomes transformative, that deals with immediate urgency, but somehow becomes, starts to add up, does change what happened before. So that maybe you push to more um, energy efficient or, or more kind of um, greener technologies. And this is what the design studio tried to do. Uh, how do you make some of this transformative? And I think that's the question I think we, we should also be discussing a bit more uh, going forward, but back to you. Thank you so much, Philippe, for this um, really deep uh, observation. This wave of NGOs, uh, I remember, started arriving in, in 2011 with, uh, you know, with the start of the Syrian crisis. And this was one of the first moments in at least the past couple of decades where this was this giant wave of international organizations and international aid flooding and people knocking on doors. They were not knocking on the doors of vulnerable Lebanese, but they were knocking on, uh, you know, the, sh the doors of, sh of shelters of where refugees were living. And, and um, I feel that has taken a complete backseat um, after the blast. It's almost as if like one misery on top of the other. And uh, I'm, I'm actually surprised to see that many of those same NGOs that uh, were shown in Serge's map, um, that were working on the, you know, for shelter uh, of refugee, refugees have actually shifted um, to, for to rebuild efforts uh, after the port blast. Um, the, uh, I think Michele, uh, who is the um, WHO Techni coordinator, who also contributed to uh, the uh, publication um and was uh, part of the process leading up to this event um would like to say something go ahead Michele. thank you marin well first of all thank you for the invitation and uh, i think like i tried to um follow up what like philip and uh, also like uh, amina and uh, someone else was, was was saying before like i think you know we are just talking about the response. We are just talking about the blast, right? But as was mentioned previously, what happened before in Lebanon is decades of uh, dysfunctional um, governance, right? So, and that is, you know, it to be um, addressed in somehow. Plus, all the COVID pandemic, right? The blast didn't appear in uh, in the middle of uh, of a easy, um, let's say, easy time for labor and for the world in itself. And again, I feel that including you know several UN agency and of course several, and I, I'm part of the UN agency, like and several like nonprofit organization, developing organization are just running behind the response, right? So we will be always late in all of that. 
if we are not trying to plan something because we know that something is happening and will happen. Like we know, we don't know exactly when and where, but we know that in certain countries and in certain regional area, they are more vulnerable for certain type of hazards. There, is, there are scientific map on that, from the climate to the yeah. complex emergencies, right? And conflict. So when we are doing this planning, I think it's extremely important to, first of all, engage a different stakeholder, but trying to avoid that this becoming a business. Because I'm very curious to follow up and um, understanding what will happen with the reconstruction in Beirut. And in general, like how the country will be started to get up from this uh, nightmare, no? So of course that we have to involve the private sector because where there is the money, but how and you know how we are going to control that there is not a misusing of funding in relation with the different stakeholders, including international organizations, right? Including international organizations, not taking this out of, of the of the of the mass, let's say, including the donors. Because I think it's our, and I hope, you know, we, we are trying to do it, I, but of course, everything is, is, uh, is always low. How we can are going to educate the donors to funding the right activities. You know, it's very easy to funding response because all donors want to have a picture with a crying baby. And I'm sorry to say that, but it's the truth. You know, very interesting what's, what's happened in Mozambique that was always affected from flooding for many, many, many years. But the time when Mozambique started to receive a huge amount of funding because of the flooding was actually after a photo taken from the helicopter, like showing a woman, a pregnant woman giving birth on the top of a tree, right? So how we are going to educate the donors also on, on started to fund it, also the preparedness plan. And this preparedness plan, of course, have to be done together and in collaboration with, uh, actually they have to be the main actors, like local governments, government, regional government, and of course, community. Because if you don't involve the community, the community will not react in a moment that there is a response because they, they don't feel that it's their preparedness plan. They don't know what they have to do. And you cannot just educate the, you know, the community after the response because it's too late. You're already you're in a war time. So I think like mm, connected also to the um, to what we are also like working a bit more like on the on the on the health uh, on the health part, um, and this also like uh, the way I contribute a little bit on uh, um, on the, on the publication. I think it's it's very important um, that we are not like that we are not trying to do and doing always the same error. Like let's try to build on the lesson learned. And it's not just you know, the same phrase that we always say in the humanitarian sector, right? But really like we have the experience and we have the possibility to do that. Now, you know, like the pandemic could be, of course it's a disaster, but it could be a real possibility to make change. And what's happening in Beirut with the blast, it is a possibility to rebuild the city in a more equal way. And I think this also that is very important because yeah, we are talking about the reconstruction, but 
who will own the land on that? You know, how will be the reconstruction of this area? Who will be in charge of that? Would it be the regulation? All of these are questions that will be addressed. Over. Thank you, Michele. I, I hear a lot of commonalities between the different responses. Uh, one being uh, that the port last was not ground zero, that we have to deal with decades of um, a country falling apart prior to that. Um, and uh, you know, the, your point about instructing donors on what to spend their donations on is is something really important because, as you said, um, the minute there is a very uh, a crisis that gets a lot of uh, attention, this is where most of the funding goes immediately. The problem is it's not a sustainable way. And the longer the crisis goes, the harder it is to sustain this kind of uh, funding. And what it does is the danger of that is that it puts um, it puts certain communities who are vulnerable ahead of other communities who are vulnerable. Um, yeah, we can we can talk about that for for hours. But like, thank you for your um, uh, you know like positive hope that we you know this is a moment for change. Be it through you know what we learned from the pandemic or through this port blast or through these different efforts or um, it is a, definitely a moment for change. And this is why we're trying to keep the conversation alive, especially being from afar. It's important to, you know, it's one way for us to stay engaged. Um, I see that Serge has a question, uh, uh, yeah. also a contribution. And after that, we're gonna move to the second question. Thank you, thank you, Maureen. Um, I would react on two points very quickly. Uh, the first is about this, this model of kind of now uh, re recovery, reconstruction is created, generated gaps. And I, I, I'll, I'll give a sample, which is quite caricatural, just to make things tangible. So you have sometimes some of the NGOs, because this also answers the question about how people reacted and what were according to their expectation and what were their, their reactions. So sometimes some NGOs really worked in a very comprehensive way and they really answered kind of, they were capable of adapting to the needs. Some came with them some very specific uh, uh, entry points and you ended up, and this is a caricature, the, the, the definitely don't take it necessarily as such. So for example, somebody is kind of rehabilitating windows, some other doors. So you end up with some apartments that are kind of well rehabilitated, but the stairs that leads to those apartment is left aside and it's not rehabilitated. So we ended up facing sometimes situations, again, this is really a caricature, but sometimes we found gaps and those gaps due to the severe economic conditions, inhabitants were not able kind of to fill the gaps themselves and the state not intervening. So he's not filling those gaps neither, okay? So you can imagine the level of frustration of uh, uh, people uh, in those neighborhoods that they want to come back, okay? Uh, even though they're facing trauma, some of them didn't come back due to the trauma. So they want to come back, but nevertheless, they're not capable of, of, of going back. Another thing just to, 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 to extend what Felipe was, was saying, and I, and I agree, totally with what you are saying, but I would say that Solidaire experience learned us that even if the private sector is present and strong and willing and aware, if the public sector is absent, the reconstruction will never happen completely to the benefit of the inhabitants and population. And we, we've gone through this. So Michele, yes, you're completely right. We should learn from those experiences. And this is why from the beginning we're saying, we cannot do without the state. They need to assume their responsibilities, not only for the later phase, but because the model of reconstruction itself won't be fair, won't be just, won't take into consideration what are their needs. And, and we, we've been through this process before, and unfortunately, we're in a way re, re, reproducing that. 
And especially now on the port, I'm very much afraid that the model of reconstruction, if it happens now within the very weak model of governance that we have, within this very high level of vulnerability that we're facing, we might end up again with a model that is not at all in favor of the inhabitants and the long and the sustainable development of those areas. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I think somehow your answers just channeled our second and third question. So we discussed a lot about the relationship of resident to resident and to the state and search at the end, like it is important to have the state uh, involved. So we're gonna skip uh, to the fourth question. Uh, since we touched on, on these topics. And if you feel like elaborating anyone more on these topics, please go ahead. Uh, as a relatively newly formed nation state with limited resources, a dysfunctional political system and under constant threats from opposing regional regimes and ideologies. Lebanon has been surviving on foreign aid to sustain itself, which has put the country and its people at the mercy of foreign will and sometimes at direct and indirect foreign intervention. Do you think these localized projects can plug into, into a wider regional project that protects the interests of Lebanese residents and neighboring communities? Uh, so I think maybe Elias can jump in as well. Yara, maybe you can talk about the experiences and how to connect with Haiti and other areas worldwide and try to create alliances uh, and everyone else is welcome to okay uh yeah i can start um so one one word that uh, comes up in multiple uh, of the of the questions is uh the interests uh, you know the public's interests, the interests of lebanese residents etc uh, we think that you know doing politics is defining what these interests are um, so think about any uh, sectoral measure that, that you might take today to try to fix things. Um, any such measure would uh, kind of invariably help some people more than others. So for example, uh, measures that you would take in uh, education uh, might favor uh, the public education sector um, uh, and hurt the interests of the private education se sector, which in turn hurts the interest of uh, kind of certain, you know, the certain churches, certain, uh, et cetera, and so on and so forth. Um, and so uh, as part of political work, uh, we should first define what these interests are. And that, of course, is uh, there's no uh, kind of uh, right or wrong or, uh, you know, systematic methodic answer to get there. Uh, that is where political choices, what we think matters more um, as part of our political uh, uh, beliefs, comes into play. And so without such a definition, uh, you know, we risk, uh, of, you know, falling into a, a pitfall of thinking that interests are very well defined, trying to do something towards that, and then finding out that, uh, you know, actually we cannot satisfy uh, uh, all of the basic needs of everyone simultaneously. Uh, and thus we've uh, kind of prioritized one group over the other, one region over the other, et cetera, just for the sake of practical feasibility. Uh, and so whenever the word uh, public's interest or interest of Lebanese comes into play, I urge everyone uh, to think of that as a political question. There's no right or wrong answer. You have to determine what your choices are. Um, as for plugging into a wider uh, regional uh, project, uh, there's, you know, just to me, there's two aspects to that. Uh, number one is, again, the time aspect. Uh, so we shouldn't be hoping for any kind of regional arrangement that's going to just uh, uh, come and be perfectly suitable. In fact, uh, our history speaks to the complete opposite. Typically, these arrangements come at the expense uh, of the Lebanese, you know, with the one of the major ones being the post-Civil War one. Uh, which was an agreement between, you know, the U.S., Saudi Arabia, Syria, and so on, uh, which was, of course, uh, uh, really bad for Lebanon in, in many ways. And so were other arrangements. And even today's government is one regional arrangement with France as a main player and Iran and so on and so forth. So why should we count on such arrangement uh, arrangements when uh, we are not uh, uh, on, on that table? 
in any in, in any shape or form. So we need to get on that table. To get on that table, uh, you need to get in you know in, in power, and to do so, you need to grow in in in, in strength and influence uh, so that you can get there. And only then can we think of these interests, which we've at that point defined uh, clearly, uh, and the interests of uh, external and foreign powers and see where Lebanon could plug in which ways. And obviously, from the perspective of, uh, you know, protecting our, our, our interests of both uh, citizens and, uh, and residents. And last, uh, back to the time aspect, you know, we are literally uh, uh, in, a, in a battle at this moment uh, between a kind of a new cabinet uh, with lots of momentum and force whose 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 literal uh, uh, you know document in the cabinet formation process uh, asks that uh, you know says that it will pursue recent expats uh, to their countries and try to figure out how they can get back remittances and capital from them. So the project is literally to get a couple hundred thousand people out in the next year or two, so that there's more uh, dollar inflow. That is simply the plan. That is it. Uh, and during this time, the banks will be refloated in a certain way that protects bank owners' interests. And we have a massive campaign in Citizens in a State at the moment uh, on that front, which actually concerns the order of engineers and architects and other uh, 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 syndicates whose uh, you know, mandatory savings have been essentially slashed away uh, and, and effectively stolen by bank owners who's, who've made tons of profits uh, and uh, at the expense uh, of, of all these workers uh, and their families. So time again comes into play and we can't really afford to wait uh, for anything for it. So on a, on a different kind of perspective from my own experience, like Haiti or also different African countries I work in, I mean, the most successful initiatives when it came to like access to solar energy, but also I've worked with on, on education, on different initiatives, it was always the, the local initiative and really this bottom up, those bottom up solutions that from at least what I saw were the most successful. And I think the way we should look at foreign aid and at donors and also, you know, every single donor, they also have their own interests. I mean, I've worked with several different government and each one have their different, you know, in personal interests or, or constraints or, um, but, the way we should look at them is there are many um, you know, donors that are willing to help the private sector and private sector initiative where they see that there is really sustainability, employment, like different really kind of social impact and you know, measures, indicators. So I think what's really important, and I've seen, I've seen that in Lebanon as well. I worked on a project where we're trying to show that um, the company, that private sector company was also was hiring, maintaining jobs, we're doing, you know, all those different steps to for climate change for, um, you know, different social positive impact. And I think the way we should look at it is really push those local initiatives and help trying to create those linkages between like donors programs and the private sector and see and, and really see how they can work together. And that's how I see we can bring, you know, it, 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 it's more kind of a bottom up solution in, in, in some programs. So, um, yes, so I think, I think that should be part of the solution and we should look at foreign aid and donor aid as, as, as really complementary. It could be technical assistance, it could be grant funding, it could be debt funding. I mean, there are different types of, 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 of aid um, available out there that's kind of more long-term. And obviously the way to track it and to make sure it's sustainable or obviously like monitoring evaluation of these type of initiatives, which are key. Um, and, uh, but yeah, that's. Serge, you have your hand. Yeah. Yes, actually I would like maybe to, to answer to Marie-Jo Basile. So her question was, how can we as individuals help the public sector get stronger? Uh, this is very difficult. I don't know as individuals, I don't know how I can answer that concerning the individuals, but I can talk about uh, one of the very good experiences um, that happened or is still happening. And we can kind of start extracting some, some lessons learned from it is the, the heritage reconstruction. 
for, for example, in that, in that case, international funding institutions, agencies, countries, and so on, even UNESCO, kind of didn't bypass the Director General of Antiquities within the Ministry of Culture, who is in charge kind of of these heritage buildings. They provided funds for technical assistance in parallel to the reconstruction process and efforts, and always required and still do. Now we're working on a project uh, with them on, on, on that. Uh, uh, they, they always require that everything goes through the administration and that the administration is the one in charge. So by doing so, they are reinforcing the role and they are helping us kind of to play this, to, 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 I mean, to play the game through these rules, which is keep reinforcing the uh, institutions. Uh, we as individuals, I can imagine that this is maybe a political answer now. Maybe Elias would like to, 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 to rebounce on that. Uh, uh, but definitely th th there's need to change politically things uh, to, 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 to empower us as individuals and to be able maybe to change the whole system. But this is another, another thing. I don't know, Marijo, if I answered your, your, your question. I just want to jump in for a second to um, react to what Yara um, just talked about, about um, the local initiatives and also what you talked about, Serge. Um, I think what we did in the studio was to try to focus on local initiatives. We looked at several scales of work, like this, this conversation is really on a political policy level. But the studio looked at how one could empower neighborhood organizations so that they could now, instead of the NGOs or link with the NGOs or link with the donors, they could implement small projects, which would in, in, in essentially um, build up the community. Uh, so I, I, I really resonate with that, or we re really resonate with uh, what you're talking about. Um, several years ago in Cuba, uh, they were about to fund a Pan American Games. What the government did was essentially to give these local individuals or neighborhood organizations technical help to build the housing for the games. And then once the games were over, those um, uh, buildings or those um, housing types were then given back to those individuals. So there was a scale of actually getting government help, technical help, getting NGOs involved, and eventually getting it down to the, um, to the community. So I totally think that if there's more emphasis on, you know, of course, the government is very, very important and they have to be in sync with this kind of thinking of getting local community um, uh, agencies, giving them agency, um, you could get a lot more growth. And that's what I think we, a lot of our students try to do in the report. Okay, uh, I think we're running over time. Uh, any final comments before we end the discussion? I know there's no, there's no straight line here. It's, it's on so many levels, on so many scales, in so many different ways, uh, from so many different places. And that's what makes it um, really rich, but also disheartening that it's, that so that Lebanon is suffering so much at the moment. Um, but yeah, to Iyad's point, um, we can talk about this for hours, of course. But do you have any like closing comments or final thoughts you'd like to share with everyone before we end? I think that there are, I mean, on the kind of the positive note here, I think, as, as one of us mentioned, I think Lebanese people are, come, are very 
innovative. They're very, like, they always come up with solution. I mean, whoever's been to Lebanon know that there's always a solution. And, and I feel that um, the diaspora is also very involved. Um, any Lebanese living outside Lebanon will still somehow have a link with Lebanon. So I think if there is a way to leverage that and to use, you know, the Lebanese, you know, brain and, 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 you know, to collectively kind of find a way to work together, even with the diaspora, I'm sure there's, there must be a solution. Thank you, Yara. Amina, do you have, I felt you, you felt you wanted to say something? Yeah, um, this has been a very, um, very interesting conversation. And I think um, a takeaway from, you know, all of these lessons learned is that at least we have, you know, built um, a lot of experience, learning, um, capacity, um, knowledge, um, yeah, uh, from all of these events. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think what's important and why do we keep doing these events is to bring people from different disciplines and backgrounds to have a conversation because as like architects and designers, we always think we have the answers, but we don't have the answers. We really need to engage with other disciplines, politicians, activists, ecologists, economists, uh, uh, like all of these disciplines and uh, I really encourage all the students and architects to keep the conversation happening. Like if we really want to make a change, like we need to engage with other disciplines. Go for it, Michele. Yeah, I just wanted to, first of all, like thank you for the invitation because I was uh, living a bit in, uh, in Libra. So it's always uh, uh, a great pleasure to to be involved uh, um, when talking about the country. And, you know, just what, what, if I can give a suggestion that it's actually like also what we are doing now with uh, this, this new, the like WHO network. I've, we, at least I'm finding that it's much easier to change big institutions and when we when you are talking and starting from the technical perspective so that is actually change a lot the life of the people that is should be our main point right i don't know if uh, hmm, I, I was working a lot like in the palestinian camp like in uh, in, in beirut for example like there are a lot of technical modification that you can do it. Electricity, water, um, a, um, ventilation. Already, if you tackle these three, you improve the life of people with huge, huge impact. And of course, when you are talking about small technical initiative, basically it's much more easy because you are not under the radar to be blocked. When you just started to take the, it can be parallel, eh? but if you started to take the discussion as much higher level into a political and policy level, is of course a much, much longer like way to go. That have to be done but we cannot wait for that to improve the life of people. So I think it's, um, this I think like would be like one of my like suggestion like for, for, uh, um, for, for some, for the, the, some of you that they are like in Lebanon or for the diaspora or, or uh, yeah. And I think it, like, this is what we are, uh, you know, trying to do with the, uh, um, and it's very interesting because, for example, everyone wants to collaborate with us because we are the technical people, right? And there is not any more political problems within the department, different UN agencies, different like ministry all over the world, because we are giving technical 
support. So I think it could be two parallel things. One talking about policy and political decision. The other things you are going into really the almost the life saving that is not response because it's the development of a country and development of economy. Because for example, I, I hear some of you talking about solar power or clean energy. This is stay with the people for for long, long time. And if you capacity build the people to basically manage this or to deal with that, it can become a business for them. For them. So it's not just giving them something. Over. Thank you so much, Michele, for that uh, final comment. It's actually a great wrap up, which represents many of our panelists here. You know, we have Manal working on, uh, you know, lighting, uh, and it's a very technical way of, of doing activist work. Uh, Amina through Impact Lebanon as well. Um, Yara working in humanitarian um, uh, situations uh, and trying to bring lessons learned from different places. Uh, Serge working on the you know regional uh, level of you know master planning and rethinking how to connect neighborhoods together, and Elias um, um, you know probably hovering and thinking more of a you know that policy political level which is going to definitely take much more time, um, and I agree with your comment um, the technical stuff can really help people you know better people's lives uh, very quickly. But of course, without uh, the right policies in place, all of that is, all of these technical solutions are very futile and they can disappear overnight. Um, if there's nothing really to, you know, like a solid policy behind it to back it up. Um, and that was really where the question for this uh, event started. Like how do we turn these short term you know, ad hoc initiatives and these, these efforts of, you know, brilliant people like yourselves who are working from different parts of the world to just help in any way you can and putting your expertise uh, in, in any way you can uh, to help at any level. And, you know, having in mind that actually it's, it's very complex. It will take time, um, but we're seeing some progress. Um, in Lebanon, I would say we've never stopped seeing progress. We've always just stood up and kept walking. And I love this about my country and I love this about your work and how it's you know, being showcased here. And uh, we would be very happy to continue this conversation in future events and the future collaborations. Um, please stay connected and I'm sure this event will provide exposure uh, of your work to other people around the world who may uh, end up connecting with you or reaching out to us to connect with you um, and we would love to you know keep this network growing. Thank you all for joining us, uh, Iyad and I and, and the collective. Uh, thank you for Dean Amal Andramos for making the time to be here. Thank you for Professor Richard and Professor Victor for um giving us the time and space and the you know the first bump up through their uh, uh, studio and you know pushing this further through the publication and engaging uh, more stakeholders um and i know it's very late in lebanon right now so thank you again everyone and um, good night thank you.